Welcome everyone to a special edition of Story Trading. We got Mark Gomes back at Story Trading. We had him uh, a couple months ago. We had a, a great conversation. So happy to have him back here on qualitative factors in pro investing. Uh, before we uh, get into that, a quick disclaimer. Um, Story Trading is not an investment advisor. Investing in securities involves significant risk of loss. This event is being recorded and it's gonna be available on YouTube later this week. Uh, Mark, you can find him at markgumstocks at wordpress.com, as well as in our story trading community. We've been collaborating for a couple of years. It's been a great relationship. So um, with that, let me just turn off the screen share. And Mark, I want to remind everyone, you had a talk with us uh, that's on our YouTube portfolio management strategies. And it was an excellent, excellent video. And if people listened to you last time, they'd be doing much better today. <laughs> <laughs> so that's right you gave him a lot of good advice that uh, you know uh very timely advice too right before this uh big volatility we had so uh doing everyone a great service with that so you know i brought you on because uh you are well known for espousing the financial model method the fundamental method of pro investing and i've always been a long believer you know in story trading the whole concept of story trading is there's more to market pricing than just the financial model. Um, right. So we try to account for that in our four pillars. So everything besides that financial model, we try to group into sentiment, technicals, and catalysts. And, you know, I've, I've busted your chops uh, privately a lot because, you know, I point out that, hey, Mark, it's, you know, you have like a sixth sense here. You know, you're great at the financial model, but I feel like you hold back a lot because, I get the sense you are really, really good at assessing some qualitative things. So that's why I invited you on to see if you can uh, pass on some of that knowledge and experience in terms of how to, how to look at those qualitative factors that you also take into account besides just the financial model. So, um, you know, I'll, I'll throw out a couple things I've observed that I think you're great at, and then I'll let, let you start. But, you know, it, it strikes me that I think that you have a pretty good knack of being able to assess management, quality of management, whether they're being honest or not, um, things like that. Yeah, you also, I think, are very good at understanding market psychology. Even though you say you're not, I think you are. I don't know how much of that goes into your trading or, or you know, investment ideas. Um, things like cap structure, which is not necessarily so you know, uh, straightforward on a financial model. I think there's a lot there that you, you, know, that you look into. Um, and also just how Wall Street operates, right? And how the sharks operate and what's going on behind the scenes. These are the things I've observed, Mark, that you're really good at. And I wanted to invite you on and give you a chance to talk about it. And I know you have a couple other things uh, you wanna to touch on too. So with that, I'll let you, I'll let you get started. Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, what's great about starting the way I started is that I understand what, uh, at least I try to remember, what the average investor goes through. Um, for those who don't know, I started like everybody else. You know, I got an, uh, interested in the stock market actually in 1987. Uh, that summer, the market was just ripping, ripping, ripping. And you know, it really caught my attention. It was in the news every day on the way to work, things like that, listening to the radio. Um, and then the crash of 87 came and that got me really interested. So, you know, my interest was there. I go to college. I'm like, I want to learn about stocks. I get into finance, come out of school. And I'm like, I'm ready. I'm going to take over the world. I'm going to be the next Warren Buffett with my college finance degree. So I take $2,000 off of a credit card, open a stock account and get murdered. Take another 2000 off a credit card, get murdered again. Did it again, murdered again. I did it over and over and over again until I was down about $11,000 over the course of three years. Problem was what they taught in college about P ratios and this and that, it didn't prepare me for all the qualitative factors and the psychological factors that are so critical to being successful as an investor. Uh, and so that's a good starting point from there. Um, you know, we can go any direction from here. So if you want a guide or if you want me to, to go, 
Let me sure. Know well, you know what? I, I got a nice uh, little story about HMNY, which I, I have a you know sneaky suspicion. Yeah, when we we're both at one time, we we're both bullish on HMNY. We we're looking at the financial model, and there were some assumptions there about how that how that would work out. And you turned negative on it uh, a good four weeks before I did, maybe six mm -hmm. weeks or so. And I feel like the turning point for you. I know you talk about the financial model. But I feel like you saw something with management there in terms of their honesty uh, mm -hmm. that really turned you off. So am I onto something there? It, it, can we talk about management first and assessing management credibility and honesty? Sure. And, and there were there were multiple factors in there. OK, I mean, not the least of which was the fact that the stock had already moved tremendously towards the top end of, of what I thought the stock could achieve. Um, despite the fact that I, I thought there was only a 20% chance. And that was bullish, by the way. I, you know, Being 20% confident that they would achieve their goals was bullish because the stock was three. And I thought it could be 50 if they achieved their goals, which meant that I felt the stock was worth 10. A 20% chance making 50 is worth 10. Well, it blew right through 10, blew right through 20. And, um, you know, at its peak, it got to 38, which was pretty close to 50. So, you know, from a starting point, there was a risk reward factor in there. But in the meantime, um, you know, you and I both were still digging into the story. The thing shot up so fast, it was really difficult to really do the kind of due diligence you really need to do. You don't just look at a P ratio. And there wasn't one for that one, of course. Um, and in fact, some of my favorite stocks don't have a P ratio there. Um, they're losing money and you can make a lot of money on companies that are losing money if their operating model is right. And that is only if their capital structure is right. Um, and a lot of that starts with management honesty. Um, you have to be able to trust what management is telling you about what they're doing uh, in order to have a successful investment. In this case, um, we had uh, in Ted um, a shrewd guy. He, he, st he stuck me right away as a salesman. Um, that's, that's not a bad thing. It didn't turn me off from the investment. You need a guy like that in the organization, okay? But it's something you got to kind of watch out for and say, okay, let's see if this guy is an honest salesman or not. Um, Mitch was clearly, to me, he was an honest guy, um, but not really capable of, you know, he didn't have the flash. He didn't have the execution. He was the, he was the back end guy with the industry expertise. And these are things that you need to assess. And you can really only do that if you meet with management. Okay, we're all human beings. We've all, um, by this point, if you're watching this, you're probably old enough to um, know the difference between somebody you like and somebody you don't like when you meet them. Somebody that's honest or not honest when you meet them. So that's really important, okay? Um, now, beyond the first impressions of an individual, right, you wanna take some notes on what are we looking for here, okay? Uh, and this is really important for a lot of you folks out there, especially if you don't have managerial experience in a company, uh, which I didn't until uh, I had to have been 30 years old before I was managing any people, before I had access to the management team of the company I was working for. And, and then you, you start to really understand how a company really works. And that's really valuable for assessing management because you're interacting with management, your own company and um, your investments, because then you get to understand a company a lot better. Oh, you know, you, you end up more patient by the way, because companies don't change every trading day. You know, uh, some of them don't even change quarter to quarter. So you want to know what is needed within an organization. So we have the salesperson in Ted. We had the kind of back end guy in Mitch. Who was running finance? Mm, that guy was not great, first of all. Okay, so that was a problem. The other problem was we saw a decent amount of cash burn going on. And what really scared me off of this name was I could see that the model that Ted presented me with, and again, Ted's not a numbers guy, he was a sales guy. So, you know, you have to be careful who's giving you the story. He wasn't like a seasoned CEO giving me the model. He was a CFO. He was a CEO with sales, you know, uh, chops giving me a model. 
So, okay, so I program the model into my computer, keep an eye on what's going on, and it doesn't seem to be working, okay? The things that he said that would happen in their model weren't happening almost immediately from month one, and certainly month two. And then it became a lot easier to look at, okay, well, we've got a summer schedule, we got a, a schedule of movies coming up that is gonna affect the model this way, okay? Um, and the last thing I'll say about that is now as a result of all that, okay, when I went back to them and said, hey, here's what I'm seeing in the model. Um, you know, this is a problem for your cash flow because you're going to need to raise more money, blah, blah, blah. The salesperson's always going to wave that off, right? If the guy's trying to sell you a house and, uh, and it looks like there's mold in the bathroom, no, 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 no. That's just a, this is a little dirt. It's a little dirt. We'll, we'll get that cleaned out. No problem. No problem. You know, no, no, don't look in the walls. Everything's cool. Everything's cool. Right. And that's what you got from these guys. Right. So by actually understanding how models work, uh, knowing who should be in the organization, there should have been a CFO, a good CFO giving me that story and explaining these things as opposed to explaining them away. That's what made me want to really dig deeper. And that's when I found some of the issues with the capital structure and all that, if we want to go into that. Uh, I'll pause for you. Yeah, well, is there anything, you, you're mentioning really the quantitative model not matching up with expectations, but is there anything in terms of character that you assessed or you saw that made you change your mind about them? Yeah, I mean, you know, clearly, like I said, uh, you're not having a, a seasoned CFO to give good explanations for why the model wasn't working mm -hmm. was a whole. You need a good financial guy in an in a organization that's trying to do what they were doing in order to make the thing run. So when you look at Smith Micro, for example, you got a real salesy CEO who also has good industry expertise. So checkbox, checkbox, right? Those are good things to have, both of them. Uh, does he know numbers? Can you trust what he says about the future? No, because he's the sales oriented guy but he has the back end relationships with carriers. Okay, both good qualities, but now I need the other qualities. I need somebody that knows finance. I need somebody that I can trust about talking about the future. Somebody that's not a salesperson. And that's where Tim Huffmeyer comes in on the CFO side. Those two are great teams, it's a great yin and yang. You just gotta know when it comes to listening to the company's future, it's Tim, not Bill. When it comes to What's the industry like and what's it been for the last 30 years and how does it work and how does relationship carriers work? That's Bill. And a lot of people won't even want to listen to Bill with that, but that's Bill. The name of the company is Smith Micro. The guy's name is Bill Smith. He started this company. It's worth $250 million. So no matter what you think about him, he did something right. And what he did right was understand the industry. So checkbox to that. You need somebody who understands the industry. See these qualitative factors start coming into play that have nothing to do with PE ratios. Yeah, yeah. And la last note on HMNO, I got a funny story about the, the CFO thing. Um, I was really naive, so it's a little embarrassing to say this story, but uh, HMNY management uh, invited me out to lunch uh, sometime you know, after I wrote a couple Seeking Alpha articles uh, you know, at, right across from the Empire State Building, went to a restaurant, and they brought along the, an MBA who they just hired from Harvard. He was on for a few weeks and we're sitting having lunch and this MBA dude from Harvard is asking me my opinion on pricing and, and their model. And uh, I felt honored. I was like, oh, this is cool. They're asking me, like, I felt special. I, I go home right after the meeting, I, I text a, a few of my close buddies and I told them what happened. And that was a turning point for them. My closest buddy is like, they're asking you, I'm selling. And I felt like, oh, I'm special, man. They're asking me stuff. So I, <laughs> I stayed on. But that would be a great example of a qualitative issue there. That's a, that's a warning sign. And, and that's a great point beyond what you just said, too. The feeling special thing is not uncommon. Okay. And it's, it's not a red flag, but it's a yellow flag. I've seen many times in the past where uh, somebody comes to me with a stock idea and I say, okay, um, what's the information? They give the information and I'm like, um, you know, where, you know, who do you know at the company? Who do you know in the industry that gave you this information? Can we trust it? 
yeah, 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 no, I, I got it from um, the CEO himself. No, oh, you know the CEO? No, no, no. Um, you know, but he, you know, he, he really likes me. Yellow flag immediately. Yeah. Okay. If the CEO likes you, he probably likes everybody. Don't let your ego get inflated on that stuff. Okay. If he's giving you special access to information, and I'm not talking insider information, but I'm talking like this guy went out of his way to tell him a bunch of stuff, you know, that the average CEO is, is going to spend his time taking care of the business, not taking care of you. And all of a sudden you're his best buddy. Mm, no, you're getting sold. Things like that you learn over time though. So, yeah. you know, when you say you're embarrassed and, and naive, trust me, I can still remember the first really stupid thing that I did. And every time I think of it, I feel stupid. <laughs> to this day. All right. Well, let, let's get a lot of topics here. So let's move on. Um, you know, uh, I'd like to really hear about, I think a very intriguing thing. A lot of people don't understand is uh, kind of the inner workings of wall street, the role mm-hmm. of, uh, investment banks and, you know, they have Roth and Maxim. You've gave me some notes ahead of time. You mentioned banking whores, you know, this is intriguing to a lot of people and we have absolutely no access to understand what's going on back there. So, uh, if you can educate us, please. Yeah. So, I mean, if, if we're going to talk about banking whores in particular, um, you know, starting from the top, investment bankers are salespeople. Let's let's make that clear right off the bat. They're brokers. So when you go to sell your house, you hire a broker. That's a salesperson. When a company goes to sell itself or sell shares to the public, they get a broker, a salesperson, the investment bankers. You know, the investment banker's job is to put together uh, a presentation designed to entice shareholders uh, or investors, I should say, to participate, buy into an offering or a deal of some sort, whether it's, you know, if it's a buyout, their job's to convince the buyer that this is the best thing they could ever do for the future of their company. If they're doing an offering, same deal. Okay. You, you guys, this is your chance to get in on this stock, you know, at, at a discounted price, buy, buy, buy. So once you understand that, right? Then you have to understand some of them are somewhat honest. Some of them are sleazeballs and and none of them are hundred percent honest. Their job is to sell you. It's like a defense attorney. Okay. You're going to tell the defense attorney everything that happened, good or bad. He's going to cut all the bad stuff out and, and try to defend you. Okay. That's what they're doing. They're trying to defend their client. All right. So when you have a Goldman Sachs or a uh, JP Morgan, companies like that, they have a reputation to uphold in the marketplace. Um, they, and they have a reputation for you know, pitching good deals. They're somewhat honest. They're still trying to pitch you on those deals. Um, but their customers are so big that they can't burn them. Okay. A Fidelity doesn't come along every day. A capital group doesn't come along every day. A BlackRock doesn't come around every day. And if those companies say, you guys have been screwing us, fool me once, shame on me. You guys are out. And and we're not going to do, we're not going to participate in any deals that you guys do anymore. And companies are going to know that. And so now nobody's going to use your company for banking deals anymore. And that's huge. All right. Now the sleazeballs, right? The Roths, the um, the maxims uh, and this is just my opinion. I'm not I'm, you know I'm not casting any uh, factual dispersions against them. Let's be let me cover my ass on that. Um, in my opinion, because of who they are and the kind of customers that they deal with, they can churn and burn a bit more. They can lie a lot more. They don't necessarily care if somebody gets sick, fed up of of their crappy deals and goes away. Not only that, but the deals they do will tend to be done at much greater discounts and better telegraphed. What does that mean? Well, okay, better telegraph means um, you, if, if you, a close customer of Max Roth, know that a deal might be coming with a particular company. Um, let's, say, let's say the ticker symbol is ABC. Company ABC needs money. And there are buy side firms that have a feeling that deal is coming, that these guys are going to need to do an offering. 
they will short the company in advance of the offering. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, they'll know what signs to look for. I can't say that they get a phone call from somebody or a little hint somehow or the other. I can't say that, but you see it very clearly. I, I, I have a strategy that pre COVID I was working very aggressively and I'll go back to soon where I make money shorting companies and buying companies ahead and, and after offerings. And what you'll find is a lot of these guys will short the company ahead of time. So you short ABC. Now you've got a short position on ABC that you somehow need to cover. Okay. Well, then an offering takes place and they say, okay, well, I shorted ABC at seven. They're doing the offering at a discount six. I'll participate in the offering. And then now, boom, I can cover my short that way. And I just made a buck. Now, if that doesn't happen, the stock's at seven. They're going to do the offering at six. What they tend to do is they bring people over a wall. What that means is they'll call, they, and this, I, this happens to me too. They'll call me up and say, hey, Mark, we got a deal for you. Are you willing to go over the wall? What that means is once I say yes, I'm agreeing that I won't trade the stock that they talked to me about. Okay. Now, if I've got a, an idea that they, of, of who they might be talking about and I'm in the middle of trading that stock, I'll say no because I don't want to lose my right to do that. I could go to jail for trading the stock after saying yes. So I say, yes, they bring me over the wall. Okay. The name of the stock is, you know, ABC. Uh, we're going to be doing an offering for ABC. Uh, we want to get your interest. How much, you know, would you like to, um, to get in on this deal? You want in the deal? How much you want to get in? Yeah. I want in the deal. I'll do a quarter million dollars. Okay. Boom. Um, now listen, I'm not going to do this because I don't want to go to jail, but what's to stop that guy from going to meet his friends, you know, and, 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 you know, or even call them if they're even more bold and be like, ABC's doing an offering, sell the stock. And you could have a deal with somebody on the side, right? Now they saw, you see this all the time. A company is about to do an offering. How many times do you see the stock drop right before the offering? Okay. All the time. All the time. So you start <laughs> to see this happen, right? Now, now, even if that doesn't happen, if you get enough of a discount on the stock, let's say the offering's at six and the stock closed at seven. Let's say it opens at 650 the next day. You can be selling your shares at 650, 640, 630, right? And, and down to six bucks and be making a profit on all those shares. But guess what? I can also be selling at six at 590 and 580 and 570 to get rid of the rest of the shares at a loss as long as my net is a profit. And they calculate these things, right? And so they're not really interested. A lot of these guys aren't interested in the offering. They're only interested in the quick buck. And so yeah. you got to be really careful. Here's the punchline. When a Roth or a Maxim report comes out on a stock, you got to be careful because there's a really, really good chance that they're just pumping the stock. They're just appeasing the client, by the way. You know, a, a report comes out on ABC. Roth initiates coverage after this offering. Roth initiates coverage uh, and ABC with a price target of 15. If you think that stock's worth 15, then why did you just give those stocks away to people for six? Because it's part of the marketing. They Part of the deal that they made with ABC is we're gonna initiate coverage. We're gonna give you a nice fat, um, you know, value it, price target, blah, blah, blah. Now, again, that doesn't, that doesn't mean that all reports coming out of Roth and Maxim are bad. You actually have to look at it analyst by analyst because some of their analysts are the banking whores. They're there, you know, my name is Martin Smith. Uh, I'm applying for the job here at Maxim. Okay, um, and this isn't exactly what happens, but Martin, are you willing to put your name on anything that we write? No. Well, then we can't hire you. We're not really interested. Oh, okay. Okay. I'll put my name on anything. Okay, great. I want you to write a report on ABC, $15 price target. ABC, I think it's only worth five. Do you want this job or not? So you'll find these guys and you can look it up on the internet. You can, you can see their, their reputations where these guys um, have like track records of 25% correct, 33% correct average return minus 20 minus 40 those are the guys you cannot you cannot trust if a report comes out by one of those guys no good okay um final thing i'll say is on the flip side there are good guys at those companies you can't have 
you can't build an organization with all zeros, you know? Um, and I'll give an example, Jim Cramer, he has a pretty bad track record for somebody who's supposed to be so smart. I can tell you from experience that, um, you know, Jim Cramer used to be a, a customer of mine, multiple firms, um, multiple firms on my side and on his side. And, and I do happen to know that he is the type of guy, uh, in my opinion, who will uh, recommend a stock on CNBC that he knows his buddies need to get out of mm. or his money Terrible. needs to get out of. Terrible. Okay. But it happens. Yeah. And all the more reason why you need to know all this stuff yourself, because you see all the sharks that are out there trying to eat your food. It's, it's rough. Uh, Mark, what, what you mentioned about uh, selling the stock or shorting the stock ahead of time before the offering um, and people call on their friends and it might be illegal. Are, are you speculating that's happening based on price action or do you know for a fact that this is happening? I wouldn't answer that question in the affirmative if I, if, uh, if it was affirmative. Okay. <laughs> All right. Let's, uh, I got that. Let's move on. Um, <laughs> let's see. Uh, you have a few other topics here. Cap structure, cash burn, industry research. I think that's a little more interesting to me because that's, that's more qualitative. So uh, let, let's touch on how you, how you assess uh who's best to breed a couple items you have here under industry research. Yeah, no, that, and that's a great one because that's I, the reason, the whole reason I'm sitting here right now is because of industry research. I, I was lucky enough to get a scholarship to Northeastern, lucky enough to meet some great guys, lucky enough for one of those guys to be pretty well connected in terms of being able to get great jobs out of college, which I wasn't I had a terrible job out of college. In fact, I had no job out of college. And then I had the terrible job out of college. But because of the tie that I had to this one individual, when an opening came up at his company, International Data Corporation, he said, he called me up. He's like, dude, you know, come join this company. And I was like, great. You know, what are the qualifications and stuff? He goes, just don't stare at the boss's tits in the interview. I was like, that's it. It's like, okay, great. No problem, right? So um, I get the job. I don't know what the company does. I don't know anything. All I know is I don't stare at the boss's tits in the interview. She gives me the job. Great. Okay. What do I got to do? Well, my job going in there was uh, you, if you, the phone rings, you pick it up. Uh, the person's going to ask you for, let's say, a laptop forecast. You're going to go find the report that gives laptop forecast open it to that page, photocopy, and fax that page to that guy. So after five years of college, I was a fax boy. But, and that was cool because I was making a lot more as a fax boy than I was at my other job. So cool. Um, but what was interesting about that is that the dudes that were calling me were Wall Street analysts. Chuck Phillips at Morgan Stanley, Rick Schutte at Goldman Sachs. I mean, big dudes. I mean, Chuck Phillips became the president of Oracle eventually. Um, these were big guys calling for these reports, okay? Um, and what I found over time was the reason that they were calling for these reports, right, was twofold. One, they wanted to put the graphics in their report. IDC says the laptop market is going from X to Y to Z over the next few years. Um, but the other reason was they wanted to understand the market. And that's what International Data Corp did. That's all we did was analyze markets, analyze vendors. We'd have vendors come in to visit us. We would try to identify every player in every technology market and meet with every single one of them and compare and contrast who's got the goods and who doesn't. Now, that's really important because when you have experts, guys that have been in the industry assessing who's top in the industry, it's like getting a, a sheet for the NFL draft saying, here are the guys that we think are the best. It's like a scouting report, okay? Without that scouting report, what happens is this, and this is exactly what happened to me. Every single company I met, I thought was great. This is a great story. I love it. I love what they're doing. These guys are going to be great, you know? And as long as the stock market was going up, I'd do okay. But the second the stock market started going down, I got crushed. And as soon as they announced earnings, I got crushed because more often than not, these small companies, which I loved dealing with from the beginning, 
most of them aren't going to succeed. So most of my picks didn't succeed. And of course, being a newbie, what was I doing? I was buying the stocks when they were up and I was selling them when they, when they dropped. I was, I was getting panicked out. So I was getting excited and jumping in high and I was getting depressed and, and jumping out low. Why? Because I didn't understand the company that I was involved with. I didn't understand the position they had in the industry and I hadn't met with management or gotten to understand whether or not management knew what they were doing or not. All right. There's a lot there, Mark. Uh, let me ask you something before we go to the other topics. Um, everything you've talked about so far, to, to what extent do you think this can be learned? Uh, you know, someone doesn't have the the background you have, not fortunate enough to have the the jobs you've had. Is it even possible to get to the level you're at? Like, what, what do you recommend for the average person that didn't have your background or, or educate or job experience uh, to just follow you or to try to figure it out somehow on their own? Yeah. So that question is the very core of why I have the Money Markham's uh, YouTube channel and why I have uh, the blog post and uh, that site that, that you were so gracious as to, to plug at the beginning of this broadcast. It's the exact reason. Most people can't reasonably get to my level. It's not because I'm too smart. Obviously, I was fax boy after five years of college. It's because the knowledge that I now have came from working 40, 60, 80 hours a week at those companies that do the things that make you a successful investor for decades, okay? And that's not easy to obtain. So can you do it? Yes, but that's what it takes. You need all the college experience I got. I went into a CFA program and learned all that stuff. I got mentorship from Wall Street guys. I was working in an industry research firm, so I learned what industries were all about, what the success factors were, all that stuff. I met with management teams, right? Can you replicate that? Not easily. So what I did with my site was I specifically set it up in such a way that if you trust my knowledge on all those things, then you can take my methodology around using risk reward and, and all these things uh, and apply them to the knowledge I'm giving you myself. Now, that doesn't mean I'm the only person you could do that with. There's something called the internet out there. So if you want to assess the management team of a company, Google it. There is so much social media out there. And, and you yourself is a perfect example. Story trading is as multiple, like large communities of individuals out in, in there who have different skill sets. Same with my WhatsApp group, right? And what we do and, and what you do in your groups as, as well as mine is your communities at story trading can leverage each other's knowledge to figure out, is this a good management team? And maybe there's a few people in the group that are good at assessing management and can go out and reach out to them and talk to them. Or maybe there's somebody in there that's really good at doing Google searches and goes out there and says, hey, I did a Google search and found out that you know, uh, this guy has a really bad reputation. He has a bad background. He's been at a bunch of fraud firms before, blah, 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 right? Just use the internet to your, exam to, to your uh, advantage and you can leverage all the work and experience of, of guys like me. Sure, and there is a skill set to uh, researching on, on, on Google. It's not just typing it in. You got to know how to do it. Yeah, so... you, you, you have to learn. <laughs> One way or the other, you have to learn something. Yeah. And by the way, that website is markgomesstocks.wordpress.com and all of your content is free, right? Oh my, yeah. Everything I do for the rest of my life will be for free. Don't ask me to do anything. I only do what I want, but I do everything for free. Great. Um, so a few more topics here. If you want to cover them, we got cap structure, cash burn and hidden value that I, let's go to the hidden. I'm trying to focus on things that are more qualitative first. So I think the hidden value might be uh, in that category. Sure. So um, believe it or not, hidden value ten, actually is kind of quantitative, hmm. okay. um, you know, and it can be both. It can be both. Um, for example, I own stock in a company called QAD a long time ago. All right. And as I was getting to know the company, um, I, you know, I looked at the, the headquarters. And if you look at the headquarters of QAD on Google Earth, 
you'll find that it's on one of the most beautiful pieces of real estate in this country. I mean, when I look, I was like, Holy, what the, this, this is their head. And then I looked around what's, you know, what was going around, right? Beautiful houses. And so I went to the real estate site and started looking up, what are these houses worth? And it was like 5 million, 10 million, 20 million. These were the, these super expensive houses all in the neighborhood. And it's funny because what I saw was a bunch of houses and then this company just sitting in the middle of it, you know, um, on a, in, on a high ground in, in California, overlooking the ocean. I was like, this is crazy. So I did an assessment of what I thought that land was worth. And I ended up buying the stock in part because there was a huge hidden value in the land that they were sitting on. And, and incidentally, um, I didn't catch this one myself. My uncle did because he was working for them. It turned out that Sears, over the course of several decades, all the Sears that they opened wasn't on rented land. It was on purchased land going back to like 1970. So by the time we got to 2000, 2010, that land that they were sitting on was worth five times more than the whole company. Because Sears, of course, at that point was, was in, the, in the crapper. Walmart had run them over. You know, the internet was coming in. Sears was, I mean, when was the last time you were to Sears, right? So as it turned out, the land that they were sitting on was worth more than the company themselves, okay? Um, if you want to get into quantitative things as well, like there were a couple uh, examples of that. We could do that as well. But if you want to stick to the qualitative, we can move on to something else. Sure. Well, the example you give a, a, on real estate, I, I guess if you're doing your homework, that could show up in a spreadsheet right it could show up from the uh it's in the 10 q's no value of the real estate no nope nope because that that tends to get carried at a, a price that's uh at a value that's more akin to what they paid for in fact mm -hmm. um you know sears said put up buildings on land okay the land doesn't depreciate um but it, it appreciates so if you can't if you buy a piece of land at a million bucks uh, and that you bought in 1970 and you don't, and that just sits on the balance sheet at a million bucks in 1980, 1990, 2000, blah, blah, blah. That million dollar piece of land could be worth 10 million, but it's still sitting on the balance sheet hmm. at 1 million. Only the, only the buildings really depreciate. So these are, you know, little things about accounting. This is where quantitative and qualitative really come together. Um, for example, if a company is hiring very aggressively like smith is like uh, zynix was a while and actually still is uh sales people and, and and amazon's a perfect example of this the best example actually over the last 20 years there's a company that wasn't making money for a long time and everybody thought amazon's overvalued amazon's overvalued no amazon was taking all of their profits and reinvesting it in other stuff so they wouldn't have to pay taxes on that profit. It's like well let's see i can either take a third of this money and give it to Uncle Sam, or I can go buy another tank or a missile that builds my army to take over the world. And that's what Amazon did. They kept on buying tanks and missiles until they were so big that nobody could really mess with them. And then they took over the world. And now you see the profits. Go, you know, go back and look at, um, there's a, a site, T-I-K-R, ticker, um, that'll show you all their financials going back like 15, 20 years, and you could see the losses, losses, losses. And then all of a sudden the profits just go through the roof. That was because the hidden value was the money that they were investing in building a behemoth masked the fact that they could have been profitable all along. Mm -hmm. So we get that in a Zynix, what they were doing. You have that in Smith and all the R&D spending that they're doing right now and the implementation work that they're doing. It's building lots of value Without and obviously the the bottom line suffers now, but later everything goes through the roof. So what people might think is an expensive company or a fairly valued company, oh, they're going to make thirty cents next year. I'll pay five bucks for that as a fair value. No, no, that thirty cents next year could become a dollar thirty the year after that. So five dollars isn't a fair value. Fifteen is, and, and that's hidden value. All that R and D they're doing, all that work they're doing to set up customers, and it's not just Smith. This is an example. I'm sure an example comes to your mind of a company that you're dealing with that's spending a lot of money and time building the foundation of what's going to be a very profitable machine in the future. 
Sure, but you know, I'm not sure that that's really a qualitative assessment. You can look at the numbers in terms of the R and D that went in, but they got to execute. They got to spend the money in the right places. You know, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So let, let me ask you. I'm going to challenge you on the question of sentiment. Um, I, we talk about sentiment a lot at, at Story Trading is one of the four pillars, and you know, the way I think of sentiment, um, for me, it's not. I don't mean to say this is an emotion of how people feel about the stock or the market. That's not what I mean when I talk about sentiment. Um, for example, let's take APT. And we talked about this whole COVID sentiment we went through, that people were very bullish on COVID stocks, and then the COVID stocks were out of favor. Um, I'd like to make an argument to you that, you know, when the, because of events, because of current events or you know, whatever it may be, whatever catalysts that are happening may cause poor sentiment. That's really a reflection, I think, of the market's assessment of how sustainable earnings are in the long term. So you may be looking at the DCF uh, and look at financials and saying sentiment doesn't matter. But I would tell you that if there's poor sentiment, it's because there's other side of the market is saying, Mark, your assumptions for the DCF are wrong. APT is not going to make any money two years from now because COVID's, you know, because all vaccines are out. So, so how do you how do you account for sentiment? Right now, so APT is actually a tricky uh, choice for that. Um, I, I would I would love to go to you know an example of a company that doesn't have like a you know a short term kind of bump. Right, the the APT example, the thesis on my side was that um, you know in addition to obviously COVID being hot and their sales are going to be hot and all that, um, the assessment was that we didn't think that it was going to be easy for new players to enter the market and therefore all the demand post COVID demand um, from the government, from hospitals to build stockpiles of inventory for future pandemics was going to accrue to APT beyond the end of COVID. Okay. Now, if that had been true, then sentiment would still have knocked the stock down. Right. The difference being if we saw evidence that the story hasn't changed, nobody else has gotten in the market and the next three years, they're gonna still be producing masks and selling them to the government and the hospitals that gotta build stockpiles, then at that risk reward low, right? And what, you know, uh, I'm not gonna give a lesson on risk reward here, but you know, you see stocks go up and down, you know, you, you, you draw the chart and you got the, the top line and the bottom line. For me, for guys like me who deal with fundamentals, we I use that chart as a sentiment guide. So when we get to the bottom of what I consider to be the valuation should not go any lower than this, which often corresponds to the long-term technicals, then I'm a buyer. In the case of APT, there was the earnings report they came out with a while back um, sent a message that other players have been able to get into the market. Um, we are being commoditized. Things are not great. And this, that means that the story changed. The hypothesis that I had put forth was not valid. We are wrong. The hypothesis is wrong. And so this is where, thankfully, you know, with the risk reward methodology, you take profits at the top. So if you get in $10,000 at 10 and now you're at $20,000 at 20, you take your profits, literally take your profits out. That's $10,000. You put it on the side. Now, guess what? Now you're playing with house money. So when the stock drops back to 10, you only got 5,000 left in the stock, but you still got 10,000 on the side and you got one of two choices. It's either the story is still the same and you go and take 5,000 out of that 10 and double down on the stock or you get out if the story's changed. And in the case of APT, the story had changed. Get out, Right with the last 5,000 that you have. And guess what? We were wrong and still made 50%. The 10,000 became 15,000. So that's how we kind of use that. Yeah. You know, one of the observations I have with the risk reward channels you have is in a sense, it doesn't really matter if, if you're right. Uh, I think the way I look at what you're doing, I think one of the big benefits of it is that it provides a point of reference for you to be objective and disciplined. And, and non-emotional. So even if your lines are wrong, right, it allows you to trade around the core, buy low, sell high. And, and that's pretty cool, even if you're wrong on your calculations. 
the what led me to 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 set things up that way is that I was and am a horrible trader. Now you would disagree with that, but without the benefit of risk reward charts, I'm the kind of guy that will buy on enthusiasm and sell when it's down low. I still have the urge to sell when the stock is getting crushed. Mm -hmm. I still get that urge, but I've learned and, and my, um, my instincts have learned over time that I make money when I buy at risk reward low. And I, and, I, and, I, and I save losses by taking profits at risk reward highs. And by doing that for years, by sticking to that, despite my every desire to get out of a stock at a low, every time I fought against that desire and made money, it, it reprogrammed my instincts. So maybe I am a good trader now. I, I still owe it just to the charts and sticking to that discipline. So what we need, the bottom line there is we're all biological robots. Right. We make mistakes and we make repeated mistakes, not because we want to, because when you make a mistake once or twice, you go, I'm not going to do that again. And then you do that again. It's because you're a biological robot. Unless you reprogram yourself, you got to find a way to trick yourself to do the right thing because you're not going to do it just because you want to. That if there's believe it or not, in a sneaky way, that's the most valuable piece of information in this entire broadcast, ultimately. All right, Mark, I, do you have time for one more topic and then a little bit of Q&A? Sure. All right. So one of the things you had here, cap structure. So this is really interesting to me because it, it, I've had a hard time uh, quantifying cap structure, even though it seems to be something that should be easily quantifiable. You know, for me, when I, when I go through the SEC filings, it's just... I don't have time to figure out or patience. It's like all over the place. It's like putting a puzzle together. So uh, what, what can you tell us about cap structure? And in particular, I wonder, besides the actual numbers and financials of it, is there any qualitative things in terms of, hey, look at all this hidden dilution the companies are doing, or they're not doing good offerings, like anything in there we can learn? Yeah. So um, I'm a, from a qualitative standpoint, that last one was a great example. You know, if, if they do have a history of including warrants in their deals, that's usually a sign. Um, warrants are a good way of hiding how bad the deal is. So in the earlier example, ABC, $7 a share, does an offering at $6 a share, but includes a warrant in that deal. If you, act, you can actually go to an optional warrant calculator to see what that warrant is worth. They're all over the internet. Just Google it, warrant calculator. And you could type in, all right? So uh, let's say that in this very example, right? Typically it's a five year exercise, right? So um, each share comes with a warrant. You guys have all seen that. Okay, what's the warrant worth? Well, you go to the calculator. What's the stock at? Six. What's the strike price of the warrant? Six. When does it expire? Five years from now. What's, uh, and then you need to throw in a volatility number and, and you can figure that out because these are usually, you know, they're volatile stocks and uh, you can look up what the, what the um, uh, options are trading at in terms of volatility. That's the only tricky part. And if all else fails, throw in something like 30, um, right? And that thing will spit out a number like a dollar or a dollar 50 is what that warrant is worth. For real, if you if you, if you calculated that right now and the calculator, I bet that number's in that ballpark. I, just, I can estimate these things pretty good. So guess what? That means that that $7 stock was not given away for six. It was really given away for like five or four and a half, right? Because they gave the stock and the warrant. And so now all of a sudden it's like, Oh my God, they gave away a $7 stock for 450 or five. That's terrible. Okay. So that's first of all. Second um, part will be quicker because I'm not going to get into the weeds. Capital structure is extremely complex. You got options, you got warrants, you got converts, you got debentures, you got the terms of each of those. You can structure a financing any way you want. And so when a company does a deal, right? When you look at the contract behind the deal, and they have links, the SEC will put link. The SEC says you got to put links, and so at the bottom of this already complex document, 
are links to more documents that show you the actual legal contract. And when you read that contract, man, I mean, you could have anything in there. You know, if the CEO's cap throws up on Sunday, then uh, we own the company. It, it, it's so silly things could, you know, there could be some crazy things in there that could cause the company to have an inability to get above a certain stock price over time because of the explosive nature of, um, of the capital structure, the way that the warrants options converts are structured, the way those deals are structured, the terms of those deals, okay? How can you get past that? Um, well, again, same deal. You look for somebody who's an expert on it. And, and I like to lean on others for this. I'm not a capital structure expert. I'm good at it, but I'm not an expert. Um, what actually helped, believe it or not, um, there are videos on YouTube. If you type in um, pump and dump, um, you know, short penny stocks, things like that, they will be, what will come up are some lessons and type in capital structure, obviously with that. Um, there are these very colorful characters out there that want you to join their trading groups, right? Shortpennystocks.com, Tim Sykes, what have you. Um, part of what some of these guys do is provide free videos to educate you on capital structure. And they're actually valuable. All I would say is don't sign up for shortpennystocks.com. Just watch the free video and learn about capital structure. Are there any tools that you could use? Because, you know, the first thing I do when I hear about a new stock, I pull, I pull it up on my brokerage account, like TD, TD app, and yep. I look at the market cap instinctually. I want to know how big this company is. And that could be extremely inaccurate because of the capital structure. Are there tools out there that are reliable that, or is it totally a exercise that has to be done manually? Nope. No tools. <laughs> Yeah, you got it. You got to do it. filings. And, and, and yeah, the, and the reason is, is that these things are so complex. You, you can't capture the terms of a complex contract uh, into a formula or number. Well, if you know somebody who's great at this, honestly, I'm going to pay someone like $200 a pop, maybe more. Like every time, uh, you know, give them a little homework, get the answer in a few hours. If Man, if you know people, let me know. Well, but, um, <laughs> Florian's an Android. Florian, Florian, you're my man. All right. So before we move on to the Q&A, just real quick, I'm uh, going to share my screen here. Again, that's markgumstocks at wordpress.com. Here's his uh, website. You can uh, click on social media there to find him on stock twits, WhatsApp, or Twitter. Um, and story trading, you can go to story trading, click on events to find out what's coming up. We have uh, mostly VIP events. This event's open to, to the world for free. We'll be posting this on YouTube. We got a VIP event this Sunday uh, on Uranium by Chris, Chris Hampton. So I encourage you to look at that. And if you want to become part of the, our community, just click on VIP upgrade and you can find us on YouTube and story trading on Twitter. So with that, let's move into the Q&A. <laughs> yeah, Florian, we're talking about you. You are an Android, Mark says. So we got a question from John Starks. When do you know to cut your losses and move on rather than holding? Oh, well, so we kind of we kind of went through that a little bit to cut your losses instead of holding. I, I, by the way, believe it or not, I never really know if I'm up or down on a stock. OK, I, I've taken it upon myself to stop paying attention to that. The reason is that paying attention to whether I'm up or down will affect my psychology and whether you're up or down on a stock has nothing nothing, zero, zero to do with whether you should own, short, buy, sell anything, a stock. The only thing that matters about whether or not you should buy a stock is the probability of you earning uh, an attractive return on that stock, okay? So if I'm down on a stock, right, um, first of all, I, I, don't, I don't know and I don't care. It's a you know, many times when I first find a stock, if I'm attracted to the valuation, um, you know, I'll build my risk reward lines, right? And so I'll have my risk reward lines. Now, if I like the stock a lot and it's in the middle of the risk reward lines. I'm still buying it. I'm initiating a position on the stock, right? I won't go full hog on it because it's not down at the bottom, but I want it in in case it goes straight to the top, right? And what happens is if it goes down, which I hope, 
I actually hope if I really like the company, I hope it goes down so I can fill out the rest of my position at a lower price. Well, guess what? Now I'm down. I don't care. I don't care because I don't think of it as being down. If I buy, if this risk reward range is 15 at the top and five at the bottom and I buy at eight and it goes to five, I don't think that I'm down three bucks. To me, I still own a $15 stock because I don't plan on selling it anytime soon because I think it's worth 15. I'm not using, I'm not, I'm not buying stocks with money that I need tomorrow, next month or whatever. Don't do that. Mm. Don't do that. Okay. Yeah. Cause Good then, advice. right. Okay. So, um, so just to, to cap off that question. So if I do buy at eight and it drops to five, of course, I'm going to double check to make sure that my research was um, correct to the best of my ability. And if I think that there's nothing that's changed in the story, all else being equal, an $8 stock that's dropped to five is more attractive than it was at eight. So whereas I might put in quarter mil at eight, I might put an extra half mil in at five. If the story's still the same, that's how you know. If the story's changed, you got to get out. I was wrong. You take losses. That's part of the game. If you try to bat a thousand in this game, you're going to have a lower batting average than you will if you're willing to take losses when you're supposed to. Excellent, Mark. Good advice. We got Bart Wa Bart Watson. Many stocks, especially undervalued developing microcaps, have price histories that don't fit very well into risk reward lines. How do you approach them in watching their risk reward? <laughs> um, sorry for laughing, but it's it's a, actually a great question. I laugh because the fact that a risk reward line happens to often with my stocks, especially fit the way this stock has gone over time is largely coincidental. And then partly by design. Okay. When I, when I first look at a stock and I look at the longer term chart, if I draw a line over the tops and a line over the bottoms, I don't necessarily get two parallel lines that move smoothly over time. And that's not what I'm looking for initially. What I'm looking for is the volatility of the company. Okay. So the width of the risk reward line is really what you got to get first. All I'm looking for when I do that initial exercise of just drawing lines is figuring out the width, which is how much does this stock tend to fluctuate from top to bottom? How volatile is the stock? That's all I'm figuring out. Next, I value the company. You build an operating model and say, okay, I think this company is going to be worth 30 in three years. I draw, a, I put a dot and you can, I've, I've done videos on this. You can, you can check it out on my YouTube channel. There are actually videos that are named this, how to draw a risk reward chart. I'll put a dot three years in the future. My charts, I can, I can pull them into the future, right? So I can look at how the stock chart will look in the future. Um, you know, not with actual prices, but with lines. So I put a dot in the future at 30 bucks, three years from now. And then I draw a straight line back to where it is now. Okay. And then I see how, I, okay. Then I draw two parallel lines around that. And I say, okay, the stock is going to fluctuate like this. I'm going to expect that kind of fluctuation. So therefore it's not going to be a straight line path from here to here. It's going to be a volatile path from here to here. And that's where the risk reward lines come in. Now, if it happens to fit the chart, great. And, and oftentimes it does. Not coincidentally, by the way, you know, the types of companies I'm dealing with are not, you know, maybe some of the companies that you, you just mentioned, but companies that are actually growing where guys like me, um, multi guys that have millions of dollars or small institutions get involved and they will tend to jump in you saw Smith was up the last couple of days while the market's getting slaughtered. It's because guys like me and institutions are like, no, nah, that's too cheap. I'm buying in. Okay. And that's what helps put a floor under these stocks at levels like this. And conversely, when they get too high, I'm like, no, nah, this is too much risk at this level. I'm going to sell. So you get a ceiling over the stock and a, and, and, a, and a floor under the bottom, not only from investors like me, but also technicians, guys that believe in the lines only. So there's a self-fulfilling action that happens there hope that helps excellent uh sounds good mark 
doesn't look like there's any other questions. Uh, Mark, we're exactly at one hour, so thank you for your time. Any any upcoming events you want to let uh, people know about? Uh, I'll be going live tomorrow. I am at Master Cap on Stock Twits. That is one of the easiest way to get my uh, real time alerts to um, you know when I go live on YouTube. Uh, of course, Money Mark Ohms on YouTube. If you subscribe to that, you'll get a notification. Um, my plan is to go live. If I haven't solidified a time, it usually happens, you know, early afternoon, like roughly after lunch, Eastern time. So thanks a lot, Ben. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Have a great day, everyone.